Hello, Iowan Nation. How are you holding up these days during these historic times? <laughs> Please do what you can to spend more time around positive, awesome people. Uh, feed yourself inspiring information. For myself, I'm taking some time to to myself each day uh, to get lost in my thoughts. Uh, like productive, <laughs> productive thoughts. Uh, I can do so by going for a walk outside or pacing around my home on rainy days. My house has a central staircase, so uh, so I walk in seriously circles around my house, and I'll leave a notepad and pen on my dining table. Uh, that's, that's one of my gripes against going for a walk, is I don't want to bring my phone with me because that'll just become a distraction, but I have nothing to write with now. <laughs> so pacing around the house is a good uh, is a good way to settle, and that I can take notes. So whenever I walk around the house, I'll do a lap. And if I have something I need to jot down, my pen, my pen and notepad are right there on the dining table so I can stop and take notes. Uh, it's crazy how many good ideas have come to me in these moments uh, to myself. Uh, and I can't recommend enough that you do the same. Health-wise, uh, I was near my heaviest weight just about two weeks ago. I was uh, 191 pounds. And that's not muscle. I was getting skinny fat. Uh, Cherry bought herself a scale a few weeks ago, and I f- and she didn't tell me, <laughs> but I found it in her closet. I found it, and I hopped on it, 191 pounds. Uh, this morning, so that was two weeks ago. This morning, I was down nine pounds to uh, at 182 pounds after intermittent, intermittent fasting the last two weeks. Uh, my intermittent fasting is pretty simple. I learned this from Dr. Cowan, who's been on the show before and, and shared it before. Dr. Cowan has spoken at, at, uh, twice at my events. Uh, I basically don't eat after dinner and for breakfast. I only have coffee with a wee bit of grass-fed butter, about one or two tablespoons. Uh, that fat keeps me from being hungry uh, until about lunchtime when I'll eat. And I've been feeling pretty good. Uh, but I, um, But I can't wait to get back in the gym. Um, speaking of gyms, sadly, my friend Denise, who owns a gym uh, in Hamilton, she announced this week that she's closing her doors uh, for good. Uh, she's an amazing athlete and an even better trainer. Her energy and passion are something to be witnessed. Uh, but even with all her talent, the business didn't work out. I could be wrong, but I think the lesson uh, is to own the real estate one's business occupies. Uh, for example, uh, we own the commercial space that we are in and our mortgages with the Business Development Bank of Canada. And they've been very accommodating uh, to, in their programs for these difficult times. They're offering their mortgage holders, um, is that, hopefully that's the right term, people who owe the money, they're allowing them to pay them interest-only payments during these extraordinary times. I don't know how long that goes for, uh, but again, uh, that's probably one of the best benefits I've seen for um, in the commercial space. Anyways, uh, in my opinion, the more control one has in their operating their business, uh, the better. It's why we chose to buy our office location instead of renting. Granted, we probably lost about a hundred grand of, of value in the property that we bought. Um, but uh, one of the uh, but the reason one of the reasons we bought, we bought we bought the commercial property is, if you didn't know, commercial laws are are heavily in favor of the landlord. It's, so to me, it just wasn't a risk that I was willing to assume that uh, I would have put so much control, so much uh, faith into a, a commercial landlord. And it hasn't worked out for many. Uh, for those who, if you've just been following the news in your local community, I'm sure you've seen lots of mom and pop small businesses uh, not fare so well i i have some friends and i've seen it many times now where restaurants and small businesses are closing their doors for good during this pandemic now one of the reasons why we were able to afford our our commercial property is because of our res, our residential real estate portfolio one of the biggest lessons in my opinion from this pandemic is the government will support those in need they'll support the individuals who and some and that makes up many of our tenants so that they can make rent in a p- internal poll of iron members uh rent collection for june was either typical of uh typical was a typical month and many were reporting 100% rent collected uh one one client of ours did res- mention that his commercial tenant he has one commercial tenant and they're having all sorts of problems with both the, the government benefit and also the tenant's ability to make rent uh, as they're not able to operate properly in, in this, during this climate. Uh, Prime Minister Trudeau this week, today is uh, 
Tuesday, I think, <laughs> June 16th. But Tr Prime Minister Trudeau mentioned this week that they are ex extending the CERB, the Canadian Emergency Response Benefit. So it looks like it's going to be... Um, it's going to be, continue to be good news for real estate investors in our ability to collect rent from our tenants. And among our own portfolio, we are 100% collected uh, for our tenants. Um, combine that with a hot market for hot, sorry. Combine that with a hot market for the properties our clients and Iron members hold. We continue to be continue to be really lucky and, and in great shape to ride this out. So a quick update on the stock hacking world with the U.S. Fed committing even more money to prop up the U.S. economy. Many stock hacker students are reporting great results. I uh, had a couple, I think just two people this week reporting that they either had four, a four-figure week or four-figure day. I know there's many of you out there and, and non-stock hackers too. I think many of you are doing very well in the stock market. Cherry continues to kick my butt in our in our friendly household competition. However, uh, combined, we're bringing in over four thousand dollars US of cash flow per week. Uh, Cherry be again beat me last week. Uh, I have a lead this week, <laughs> so the current score is eleven to two for Cherry in Cherry's favor. Uh, at the end of the day, I hope you're all improving your cash flow positions through the small business, real estate, stock hacking, Bitcoin. Uh, I was actually conversing with, uh, I was DMing, exchanging DMs with my friend Savio, who is in Windsor. I asked, how is he doing during these try trying times? He goes, what trying times? <laughs> he's been picking up property left, right, and center. And that's, he's not the only one that's been telling me that too. So there is opportunity out there. Hopefully you're out there, out there uh, banging on doors and taking advantage. So again, uh, my point is, I don't care how you're making money, as long as you're doing so in an ethical way and you're making a difference in your community. So speaking of people who make a difference, we have an author on today's show uh, and an old friend of mine named Roger Auger. Uh, I don't have Roger's bio, so I'll read you the description from his new book, No Excuses, that's available on Amazon and chapters and I'm sure other places as well. So here goes. Deadbeat, loser, failure, criminal. Imagine growing up in a family where those whose words were meant to be your future. Without loved ones supporting you, would you too believe you'll never amount to anything? All around you right now, there are kids who dream to be great but live without support or circumstances to do so. Whether you were raised to with encouraging parents or you bootstrapped your way on your own, you have the option to give a, kid, a break to a kid in need. Successful real estate investor and business owner Roger Auger knows firsthand. No excuses is his story of hustling, of hu <laughs> no excuses is his story of hustling stolen mac and cheese and paying his parents' mortgage at age thirteen to running a successful real estate empire. Carve out your own path and learn what life can be like at home for some kids, how to spot a kid without support, and the little things you can do that have big impact. How hard work can make almost any dream a reality. The path to creating a better future through real estate investing, even if you're a kid who comes from nothing. Why you could be the answer to changing someone's world just by giving them a chance. No excuses gives us hope that the world can be improved one kid at a time. The world doesn't give you handouts, but those, but with a dose of Roger Auger's hustle and paying it forward, you could be on your way to success. So without further ado, I give you Roger Auger. So Roger, what's keeping you busy these days? Um, my own properties and buying, flipping, and house selling, and launching my new book. Okay, before okay, so you mentioned the book last, so we'll do the real estate first. How how many hours a week does your real estate take you between all those uh, different things that you do? So maybe about two hours a week. You average it out. That's it. That's it. Means you have a lot of free time. I do. I set my properties up right, so my properties are set up good with good tenants in them, and uh, I spend a few hours a week dealing with some issues or making some text messages, and that's it. So hang on, two hours a week <laughs> or two hours a day? A week. What about like what about wholesaling and filling? Um, wholesaling and filling are different part of business, right? So my real estate profile takes about two hours a week. Okay, okay, okay. Wholesaling is, it could be from one hour to 10 hours, depending on what call to get. Mm -hmm. And then the filling uh, with the COVID right now, we're getting 
very little fills. Um, we're, but we're also weaving them out before we actually close the properties. Uh, we get a lot of calls, a lot of texts, a lot of emails, but we don't actually, as before we call that, we just go and show the property. Mm-hmm. But now we actually uh, answer ask questions and then get applications sent to them and see if they're serious. And if they're serious, then we actually build the property. So it doesn't spend, we don't spend that much time doing that as well. Right. What's, what's changed in your process then for, for, with COVID screening uh, for, te- for tenant filling? We actually get applications done before we actually show the properties. Uh-huh. And what's the response been from tenants? It's a 50, 50, the ones are, uh, the ones that are not serious with the properties don't mm-hmm. fill out the applications mm-hmm. and the ones that are serious fill the applications out and send their information. What would you say the split was before COVID? Like say you did show a property and then you asked them for an application. Well, when was, I it high, property, was it better or worse then? When I showed the properties, about 90%. When my wife or my son or whoever else I hired showed the properties, like 60, 70%. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's tough, to, it's, it's, the, it's tough to outsource. You need to train them better. <laughs> yeah, but then I find who's serious who's not, right? Because I kind of have a sales aspect in the back behind me where yeah. Crystal and Joshua and the others don't have the sales aspect. Yeah. So they're leaving it. And we find who's serious by, by applications, right? Right, right. And I also taught them to kind of brush people off that are acting a certain way. Uh-huh. What, what, are certain, what are some of the tells that, uh, that, that indicates a non-ideal tenant? If you are Let's be gentle. A family, <laughs> if you're a family, if they're on time, on time, on family and students, no matter on time is very important. Second part is how they uh, present themselves to you when they come up to you. Uh-huh. The part is how, if there's a family, it's how their kids are acting. I always look at how their kids are behaving. Mm-hmm. Um, and then also how they're, they present themselves. So if they are nice, kind, and very respectful to you, then it's mm-hmm. great. Mm-hmm. If they're just kind of shove their shoulders and, and brush you off then right. it's not right i i every time i see a person to rent the property i i consider it as a job interview uh-huh. so if they're if you go to a job interview you're going to be at your best behavior and well-mannered and well-dressed right if they are going to a property and they don't have any of those items then i don't think they're suited for the property right right and by that theory my tenants i have in my properties are, are great mm-hmm so uh, that's a great theory. Uh, and for, I think most listeners of the show will understand where we're coming from. There's this whole other like social justice group out there that thinks, oh, you shouldn't judge people by the way they, they present themselves. But like your point, if they present themselves well, as if it's a job interview, it probably means they're employable. And if they're, yes. if they're gainfully employable, it means they'll have income. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. And, and, I unfortunately you do judge people from book from the cover and you know, I could be wrong. Right. But with my experience, I found that the ones that I get along with and ones that I talk to because they're acting to their job interview uh-huh. are longer lasting tenants with me. Right. And our relationship for us stay together. Whenever I went against that, um, that theory, because I thought it'd be a different chance, you know, this person chance, whatever it bit me in the ass. Right. So I'm going by what I been experienced by um, for the last well, 10 years. I've been doing it. And how many tenants do you think you've gone through? Oh, with the prop management business over 2000. Yeah. Okay. So you've, you've gone through a lot of tenants. Where to now? Uh, so, you, you, so let's talk about your portfolio just briefly. Um, well, you're a past guest of this show, so if anyone wants to go back and and, and listen to about Roger Auger again, you uh, again, I think I had you on maybe three years ago. Yeah, yeah, when I had the, the property management business. Yeah, you did. You had we'll me some the, uh, questions. We'll, we'll get to the PM business uh, later, a bit later. Uh, but you've so uh, in your book you wrote about that you have 14 properties currently, but you've probably had at least double that number come through your portfolio. Like you currently yeah. hold 14, you've, but you've probably bought a lot, bought and sold a lot more than that. Yeah. Sometimes you have properties that are not performing uh, to the, the newer aspects you want to. So you would sell a property and buy another property, or sometimes you have a property that um, it doesn't fit your portfolio anymore. So you want to sell it off and buy a property that does fit your portfolio. 
Um, or sometimes you just buy, have a property with a joint venture and then the joint venture wants out, so you have to sell it. Um, or you just buy a property and we, I renovate and I flipped it. So yeah, I've done dozens of, of those. So you, yeah, okay. So I guess that qualifies. And then how long? When, when did you buy your first investment property? Um, you didn't give years in your book. <laughs> I don't know if that was no, intentional no, lot or not. <laughs> I think I bought my first property. Um, wait, when did Rockstar start? Rockstar started in 1999, I think it is. Rockstar Ritzer. Um, my first property. I think it was that early. I bought when, okay, Josh was 15, 17. He was four years old. No, he was four, five, five years old when he bought the first one, so 12 years ago. 12 years ago was your first yeah. investment property? Do you remember yeah. what you paid for it? How much? 155000 on up in Mohawk College area in Hamilton. 155000 Yes. For like a detached bungalow? Yes. A six bedroom student house. What did you rent for what did you rent it for back then? Uh fifteen hundred. Oh, so you got that magical one percent rule? <laughs> <laughs> Which does not uh, exist today. <laughs> well, now it's rented for twenty two hundred. Now it's rent okay. So you increase the rent by seven hundred dollars in twelve years. And what's the property worth today? Uh, about 420, 430. That's it. It's a, it's a side split. It's a, it's a side split. Ah, uh, okay. So, one, that was uh -huh. my first one. Uh -huh. But a month, technically a month later, I bought two other ones. Uh -huh. Um, for one was for 245, and one was for 249 mm -hmm. from the same person. Mm -hmm. Um, and those properties are worth today 550. And what did you rent them for originally? Um, it was three hundred and seventy-five dollars a room. How many rooms is that? It was six bedrooms. Three seventy-five a room times six. Yeah. Very close to the magical one percent rule again. <laughs> <laughs> what do they rent for today? Thirty-four hundred. Thirty-four hundred. Oh, did you duplex them or uh, still student duplex, rents? I duplex them one, and then I want yeah. the student rental still. We just charge a lot more for rooms. We're charging right. five fifty room and seven rooms now. So what is what has your real estate meant to you? Real estate has given me a lot of people think real estate gives you um, lots of money and, and and stuff like that. It has, but it's given me freedom. So the floor, it, it, it lets me do what I want to do and lets me you know do something that I've never thought I could ever do my entire life because I'm a terrible speller and terrible at grammar. At grammar, um, real estate's given me the opportunity to do what I want to do, freedom, like life freedom. I can retire tomorrow if I want to. I can just, you know, do nothing. Mm -hmm. it's, it's given me my choices, what I want to do. My, my kids, uh, have a wonderful start. And it's given my wife freedom to do what she wants to do as well. And a nice home. Uh, Roger, can you share what your portfolio is worth today? Oh, crap. Um, about seven or eight million. Eh? Seven or eight million dollars, and so I have a pretty good guess what your net worth is. I, I, we don't have to share that. I think everyone else can take a stab at that. Uh, and now let's go back to where it all began. And which, so let's talk about the book because I've known you for a long time. We met in what twenty eleven? Yes. Yep. Yeah, about that. It's been a while. It has been. I remember the first conversation we had with each other. Yeah, we met in the summer, was it not? Twenty yeah. eleven. Yeah, when I uh, when I when Jillian bought Broadway, um, Cherry met me, and then Cherry introduced you to me, um, and I just bought my property on West Second. Yeah, so tw no, twenty eleven. Yeah, about twenty eleven. 2011, 2012. Summer 2011. All right. So it's, I've known you for a while. I didn't know about all this crazy ass shit that you went through before. <laughs> no, no. And there's, there's, unfortunately, there's a lot more things happening in my life that I did not put in the book. Um, uh -huh. they, they'll come up later on because they're really emotionally draining on me. Right. Um, so we left some things out. Um, maybe for book number two, because I really believe that um, there is no excuses for anybody and any 
situation, you can do what you needed to do. Right. So, uh, and for many times, I don't know if you know, but many times I've used your story on people, why there's no excuses. And oh, no, I didn't know that. Yeah, I've used it many times. Um, like you barely passed high school. Yes. You own 14 <laughs> houses and you have, you're a multimillionaire, right? Yeah. I know many people with like master's degrees and PhDs who, who don't have a fraction of your net worth. Well, that's sad. And they that's own, so sad. and they'll have, and they'll have like two incomes that are six figures in their home and they still don't have, uh, they don't have nearly your net worth. <laughs> so <laughs> hey, I, uh, started, I started making 40 grand a year when I started buying real estate. Like I, you just figure a way to do it. Right. I, I never made six figures into now, but um, I never made it in my entire life until I started buying real estate. So let's talk about the book. What's it called? No excuses. And you can get it on Amazon. I got, I bought mine on Amazon Kindle. I just like Kindle a format, but, you can get it on Amazon, you can get it on Kindle, you can get it at Chapters, you can get it. Um, you can get it in well, store? You're in you store at Chapters? Yeah, you can order it in store, Chapters. I know. <laughs> Isn't that weird? And uh, we are doing the audiobook. Uh, one of our really good friends of mine suggested to do the audiobook. So the audiobook is going to come out in a few months. That's awesome. Um, I talked to a couple people already about it. Awesome. Share some tips, eh, for like hardware, because I I need to work. I need to. Well, you know, I got an office, so I plan on yeah. getting equipment for the office to be able to do in person uh, recordings. Um, okay. So, uh, so to continue with my <laughs> my sharing of your story, and now that I know more of it by reading your book, uh, you have challenges reading and writing. Can you can you elaborate on that? Yeah, I do. So I. So I passed grade 12 English with 50%. Um, and the only way I passed was my teacher at the time hated me and I hated her, unfortunately. And I said to her, I said, well, if they don't pass me, I'll be back here next year in your class. So then she passed me with 50%. Um, I was in a car accident when I was younger and I had a hard time um, after the car accident to read and write um, because the car kind of ran over my head. And from that day forward, um, I was hit by a car, Erwin. I don't think you ever heard about that. No, you told uh, me. Yeah, I was hit by a car, and the car ran over my head. And at that point forward, I had a hard time speaking. Um, I always mumbled, and I couldn't really comprehend reading um, as good. Or I can read it, but then I can't absorb it as good as I wanted to. And I also had a really hard time with spelling and grammar. And to this day, on my age, I'm 45, um, because I don't actually – have proper spelling uh, words so to me reading a book to write a book is is impossible it's an impossible it's impossible until you start training yourself to do it so one of the things that you mentioned to me i said that because my story my history i should write a book and i laughed at you when you told me and then i talked to my wife and she said you should write a book and see how many spelling errors you do and all that stuff so then we reached out to a mutual person and talked to her and then we started writing a book and she had a hard time with it um, with me as well because the fact that my spelling is terrible, my grammar is terrible. Like I'm a probably a grade one or grade two in spelling and in, in grammar and writing. What so, happened with the car accident? So what happened was we were my mom, my my best friend Jeffrey at the time, um, and myself, and we're going to Marineland in Niagara Falls, and. Um, this car, this truck actually ran, um, was a 16 year old driver, um, lost control somehow of a vehicle. And she decided instead of pressing the brakes, she pressed the gas pedal. And she came on the sidewalk and she, um, I pushed my mom out of the way, my best friend out of the way, and she hit me. And then when she hit me, I went underneath the car and then her front tire ran my head over. And then I was rushed to the hospital. Um, and I woke up in a hospital like a day and a half later um, with like scratches and bruises and I was in crutches because I had an uh, ankle issue. Um, and yeah. How old were you? I was probably 15 or 16. Good God. Yeah, I was actually, uh, 
what kind of saved me is that I was a very, very athletic in school. Like I was doing a lot of weightlifting. Um, so I guess that's what I was doing. And then at that point, I couldn't lift weights for a few years. So I just lost um, the urge to do that. So then I started gaining weight other ways. But um, if I didn't push my mom or my friend all the way, because they were a lot smaller than me, they probably would have not made it. So the injury compounded the um, – from your book, it sounded like education was not a priority in your household. No. No. Education was not. You, I could not have to go to school. I didn't have to do anything like that because um, I, there was days that my mom told me out of school. We went, we went to the food bank or whatever to, to get food. We – there is never a, like, hey, you need to go to school. You need to, you know, go to college or university. There's that drive. It's just like, whatever. You don't need to do what you don't want to do. My dad had grade six education. My mom had a grade seven education. And they were never um, pushing school on any of us. Um, and if we come home with, with, you know, a decent report card, as long as it was that class 50%, they were happy. There was never, there was never rewards or anything like, anything like that um their main concern was okay well we need money to pay the mortgage we need money to pay the the next hydro bill or gas bill before it gets shut off my dad needs money for booze or whatever that was the more concern of of life how we get the next dollar then versus let's do something for our kids roger what did your parents do for income um my dad was um the benefit the best part of my dad's our life when we were growing up was when my dad was working for the Hamilton Street Railway with the HSR. Uh, uh-huh. He's a bus driver. And then the, my dad somehow became an alcoholic and into, well, he, because he hung out with the wrong people. Um, and then he lost his job as the HSR bus driver. Um, my mom was, yeah, he got fired for, uh, for drinking. Um, On the job? Pretty much. You think so, yes. That's a great and job. <laughs> It was. It's steady income, and you always have hours, and you're always doing it. When I was a kid, I used to remember bringing my dad lunch to the bus stop and going for a bus ride with my dad, right? It was awesome. And, um, then he lost his job, and then when he lost his job at HSR, he just went down downhill. He started working for uh, like other companies, like a truck driver, where he smashed into a bridge, and he worked for um, another bus, a, a, a mushroom company, where he was driving a bus for them, and he, he wrecked that bus, and he just kept on losing his job over and over and over again. He couldn't, couldn't hold a job for more than like a year with, um, with any company after he lost HSR. So he was, I believe that he just was really depressed or something, but he really, um, his, his, his thing was to drink, like consistently drink every night. And he would take stuff out on us because he would be always angry. My mom, she was a cafeteria. Uh, person where she made food in, in the school cafeterias and then and including government right when did they start relying on you for income no I was 12 I was 12 years old when I started my first business I sold um I bought video games off of off of people I used video games and I sold them in in the flea market stand um, on Sundays and I also had uh, a tools contact and I bought a bunch of tools from a manufacturer and sold them at the flea market stand and I was making enough money on a Sunday to pay my parents mortgages their, their bills from that point um, and I did that for probably a couple of years and then I started scalping tickets I started doing some other legal stuff to to make money I was always trying to find ways to make money because that was that's the way I was I was uh, born to I guess and it was just you, right? You, your parents didn't rely on your brother and sister for income? My brother and sister did help. Um, but my brother was doing it before me because he's obviously older than me. And then he gave up. He stopped doing it. And then he obviously, um, they were very angry with him. And my sister did help when she had work as well. She worked at McDonald's and stuff as well. And she put money in. Um, but if, to me at 12 years old, 13, 14, 15, it felt like I was the only one giving money. To the household and i would see like, the end of the month money would come in and they, were, they wouldn't need anything and then a couple of days later they would need something and it was consistently always giving them money for my dad's cigarettes or um 
a hydro bill or whatever. So if I made a hundred bucks doing something, 80 of it was gone easily to them. And it was like, it was the attitude that you live in my house, you need to pay. So now you're a big football fan. Like you're still a big football fan. You get season yeah. tickets now to the Hamilton Tiger Cats. I am. And, but you, you would ask for people, like when you're, as a kid, you would ask people for tickets, but you, would, you wouldn't go. No, I would sell them because the money was more important to me than the, the city game. So I always kind of am seeing a game because I always kind of went in after first quarter or halftime. Um, but what I would do for tire cat games, I would find a parking lot and I would park cars at the beginning of the game, like way before the beginning. Once that parking lot's full, I would run down the stadium and then ask, like walk up down the street saying, who's got free tickets, who's got free tickets? And then I would get them and then I would sell them. Um, and then that would be uh, like, I don't know, three, three to $400 a game I would, I would have. And I would take that to home with me. Can you share the story when the, when someone gave you a ticket and then they, they caught you selling it? So I would walk up and down the street asking for who's got free tickets, who's got free tickets. And a gentleman um, I didn't know had a season tickets. And when you have season tickets, you're in the same seat all the time. So he gave me one ticket and said, I'll see you inside. And I said, yeah, no problem. And then when he went in, I sold the ticket. Um, and then I guess when I sold the ticket, the person that bought the ticket talked to the person that gave me the ticket. And then the following game, I was walking up and down the street again. And then the person that gave me the ticket said, came up to me and confronted me saying, you uh, sold my ticket last night. And I was like, yeah. And he was like freaking on me. And I said to myself, I'm just scared. I, yeah, you're right. I did. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I just need food because the money I made that for you know a few days, and then he just felt like he was being an ass, and then apologized and gave me another ticket. Um, that happened a few times. It just that wasn't the first time that someone caught me to the point where I start asking to buy tickets. So I start buying tickets very low and selling them for more. How 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 um, how many days of food would selling the one ticket mean to you? Uh, two days, two to three days. So, Roger, like you wrote about in the book about how you didn't know there was another side to to life, no. and I felt the same way when no. I was reading in your book about the amount of poverty, the amount of negativity. The, uh, the amount of bullying, uh, the amount of poverty, uh, the lack of pushing of by your parents, the lack of support. Like that's the, uh, it's a completely different world from where I came from. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and unfortunately, that's a completely different world for a lot of people because when I was growing up, um, that is normal to me, you know, struggling for, for food or struggling for, you know, we're stressing about bills being paid, stressing about, I, like, that was a normal situation for me, um, which <laughs> it blows the crap on myself now when I think of it, that's not normal. And when, when I started to realize that that wasn't normal, it was really, really hard to, to function. And there was a lot of mixed feelings then that I don't touch on in the book that I, that I went through. Um, but once I saw the other side, I wanted, I strive more to become the other side. And I was, I'm not a smart guy when it comes to schooling. I, I cannot do schooling because I have a hard time um, when I read something to, to absorb it. So I knew that the schooling would not change it. So I knew that I was always a, a, a hustler or an entrepreneur. I could figure a way of doing it. And well, when I was uh, 12 years old, I did a flea market stand. And I was from 12 to 16, I was doing scalping tickets and parking cars in Hamilton and some Toronto events. And then when I was 18, I opened up my own hot dog cart business when I had enough money to save to do that, right? So I always found ways to get I wanted to get out of the situation I was in and when I moved out when I was 18 years old from my parents house um 
was kind of forced out because it was either one one way or the other. And I already had goals set because I did not want my kids, if I ever had kids at the time, or I did not want to live that lifestyle. I don't like living that lifestyle. And I don't think anybody should live that lifestyle. And there's always a way. And once you see the light, that's what the book, well, once you see the light, that that's not normal. Poverty is not normal. There is, that's, that's not the norm. Did I answer that question right? <laughs> There's no right or wrong answer. So one one of the things I want to say is that when you're growing up and you're you're in a rough situation, um, that is not normal. Um, if you're when I was growing up, my dad abused me too. I was able to defend myself. My dad was an alcoholic and drug addict. My mom was bipolar, but she's never diagnosed. But we all know she's bipolar, and she would never agree to any of this stuff. She just say it never happened or she would forget about it or whatever. My brother was, was my protector for many, many years. Um, and, and struggling for food or struggling for, for not having the hydro cut off or the gas cut off because in winter and stuff like that. And I would like driving like Porsches or Corvettes down the street. I just thought they were just a bunch of kids that were just driving the neighborhood laughing at us. And I didn't know that there was a middle class that didn't depend on their kids to, to live. Like I, I thought that people were having kids to help them pay for the bills and, and to help pay for their habits and stuff. So when I saw the light, I guess you would call it, or the, the difference, it was hard because my whole life was a lie. My whole life was insane. And when I saw the opportunity that there wasn't, that wasn't normal, it, it kind of made me more angry and made me more frustrated and made me want to do certain things that I sh- I'm not going to talk about what I want to do, but it gave me also the, uh, the opportunity to see, okay, I want that. I want the life where I don't have to worry about everything. I don't have to worry about, Hey, can I sleep tonight without getting beat up? Can I, can I sleep tonight without, you know, him looking for more booze or more drugs. Can I, can I sleep tonight and wake up tomorrow morning and the hydro is still on? Um, that's the stuff I wanted to, do, to live. And then the, the stuff between my father and I became even worse because the fact that I knew that there was a better life. And I don't understand why he would not want the better life for himself and for his kids. And then once I got out of my house and all of that situation, um, I... I was much happier and much better living. And then I just wanted to work harder and drive and get more things done and find opportunities. And I knew there was, and I just had to find it. And for, for a person that didn't have anybody to help him, except for I saw my uncle Bill a couple of times. Um, as I said in the book, he's the one that kind of helped me as well to show that there is, this is not normal. And, and it, it just, I don't know. It just it kind of overcame me and I just wanted to be better. And now to this day, I live in a great house. I, my kids are, are amazing. And my wife is incredible. Um, I've never touched my kids and I never will touch my kids. I never will touch my wife. And I never will touch my wife. And I build enough, income and, and, and um, assets to, for my kids to have a good start if something happens to me tomorrow, for example, where they're not going to have to worry about struggling. My, parent, my kids never knew about food banks until we did a charity. My kids never struggled for anything. We never had a hydro cut off. We never had gas cut off. We never had a broken down car that we had to push down like 10 blocks to get home. We never, we never had those issues because the fact that I keep, keep going and I'm not going to stop because I don't want to be back in that situation. And when you are born in a good family, which 90% of hopeful people are, you don't see the inners. And if you ever switch shoes with somebody that's in poverty or in that situation, you will be devastated. Like it just, it's really hard. Um, and that's why Erwin and myself know and a bunch of my friends know that, but I have a 
huge drive and I just don't want my kids to ever, ever worry about it. Like my son is going to become a lawyer. My, my daughter wants to become a doctor. Like that's just, that's incredible from a person that just has 50% average in high school diploma. It's because I didn't want that lifestyle. And right. when I saw the opening, I took advantage of it. The interesting thing is a lot of people say like, like I, we preach it as well. Real estate is not a get rich quick scheme, but for like in your own experience within one generation, no, it's not. Everything has changed. Right. Yes. Yeah. Like, like where Real your speak- parents came from versus where your kids are going. Everything's changed. And that, that's what you want. As a, as a parent, you want things better for your kids. And when my son, we talked about my book as well, my son was bullied and it took every single ounce of my being not to go there and destroy those kids or their parents. Um, and that's how we met Nancy, by the way, at the, at the school. Hmm. Um, it's because my son, Josh, was being bullied and Nancy and I became very close because she was the one that calmed me down. And the, the angry... The, 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 the history my history is is still there and it's hard for me to let that go but I have to and that's the reason why I wrote the book because I'm tired tired of people saying I can't buy this property or I can't do refinancing or I can't get the loan or I can't you know do this I can't do that that's all excuses and, and the other reason why I wrote this book is because there's somebody out there that are living the same life I'm living or lived and they don't know there's a light, a different life style. And I'm hoping this book will teach that person, get to that person somehow and say, listen, this guy went through the same, roughly the same things you went through and he made it out. Um, I'm not an athlete. Like I'm not an athlete where it's easier to get out or uh, a, a singer or a performer. I'm just an average Joe. And there's a lot of average Joes out there that live a terrible life. And I want these books to, to help them show, hey, he can do it. I can do it. And hopefully they can get all the situation they're in. And being abused by your parents or having your parents, you know, uh, being drug addicts or being on the social system is not your life. Life. Your life can be different if you want it to be different. You just have to want. It's 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 um. I'm hoping it will help someone, at least one person. That's why I wrote the book. Roger, can you share the craft dinner story? Where, where did the <laughs> so, craft dinner come from? So, my, like mentioned before, my dad uh, when he got lost his job at HSR, um, because they became an alcoholic and he was heavy into drugs and he was hanging around with the wrong people at his age, which is strange. And somehow this guy um, stole a truck for a craft dinner. Stole um, the whole truck, not just the trailer, whole, not just not, the contents. He stole the whole truck. The whole truck. And then they unloaded it in my dad's garage and the truck went away. And then we had thousands of boxes of craft dinner in the garage, like from ceiling. It was a, two and a half car garage full with craft dinner. And so he, the guy was there and I was looking at the craft dinner and being who I am, I was like, I'll sell that. So I he goes, okay, go ahead. So I got a How old are you. Uh, so I was in high school. So it was grade nine, grade nine. Um, yeah, but grade nine. And I got beat up for the selling craft dinner. So I was, okay, I'll sell it. So I got a wagon all um, we had and then put boxes of craft dinner in a wagon and I went door to door in the neighborhood and sold the craft dinners. And, and I sold a lot, a lot of craft dinner because, you know, 69 cents at the grocery store and I was selling for 10 cents a box when it was. And we sold a lot. And then I was sitting there watching TV and then all of a sudden our front door got kicked in, our back door got kicked in and our house got raided. Um, from the police. Um, you have to kick in doors for. <sighs> okay. okay, continue, please. So, so, I, so I shit myself, and they're like, 
then they arrested my dad and um, they didn't arrest me. They just left me there. And I was like, what the hell happened? And then uh, my dad got out, got out of jail because he, um, he, they, were, they wanted, they wanted a person um, that stole the craft dinner. And my dad's like, no, no, I rent the garage out. Um, I don't know what we're talking about. And then um, they took all the craft dinner with them and my dad was arrested and he was released and that was it. And then I lost, and then I lost my income for that two months period because I was selling the craft dinner and making money. Um, and then this, these are the your newspaper. parents. These are your parents involving you in the legal activities. Yeah, that wasn't the first one, but yes. And then that was somehow it hit the newspaper. And then of course I had, you know, my dad's name and my dad's name is Roger Auger. My name is Roger Auger. And then the high school kids found out and then I was had craft dinner in my blocker and I was made fun of for a long time because of it. Because Italians don't like craft dinner. I was in school with a bunch of Italians. Um, so, um, yeah. <laughs> But to me, it was an opportunity to make money because I didn't know better that it was, I didn't know it was stolen at the time into a police raid at our house. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so you teach your kids something differently. I thought it was pretty cool. Uh, in the book, you, talk, you talked about how, uh, like say when Josh, actually just touch on Josh as well, your son. It's funny that he got bullied because he's an absolute monster now <laughs> and he's like yeah. the high school he's a he's a he's a he's a football phenom <laughs> so, it'd be funny that for son, someone these kids that must have bullied him must have been even bigger <laughs> no weren't my son was my son is is a loving and caring individual person he will be there for you snap a dime and when he was in grade um seven at uh, the school he was a little bit bigger than, than, than they were, but because he was never taught or never been in a violent situation, the other kids that were there, for some reason, attacked him. And when you have a person that doesn't defend themselves um, or doesn't know how to defend themselves, and that's my mistake as a father, and I teach my son that, um, he, uh, he got bullied. And now, there's a little bit, I don't know, it's not, it's not, I don't think it's in the book, but so he got bullied and he was devastated. And then I talked to him how I was bullied and became out of it and stuff like that. Um, to this day, it affects him a little bit. So in grade nine, the kids that bullied him went to the same high school he's into. Except for Joshua became a lot bigger, a lot stronger, a lot faster. And then those kids were bullying another kid in high school and Josh stepped in and he threw a couple of them around like little rag dolls and that kid um is like thinks Josh was a, is a god and now Josh was massive he's 17 you, you just mentioned he's big and those kids that bullied him are half his size and he doesn't bully them he just walks through them with a big smile on his face um because he knew that they know that joshua would, would would hurt them and now joshua is actually known in school to protect the smaller kids that are being bullied he actually steps in so being bullied now he's the one that stops it and that to me is incredible isn't it that the high school is like running back and quarterback of the yeah, football team he, he plays he plays yeah it's because he is on the football team he has a lot of respect from the guys that are bigger than him too right so he plays uh, linebacker, um, <laughs> plays running back, and he plays um, – he's on the kicking team, and he's on the punting team, and he's on the receiving team. So he's on, never is off the field. And we had a meeting last night with his coach, and his coach is doing a highlight reel for him for university now. Um, right. Joshua has is, is come a long ways from being bullied in grade seven to the size he is now. Like he's 210 pounds, and he's six foot three. He's 6'3 now? Six two, six three, yeah. What's he six, benching? Um, almost two ten, I think it is. How many times? <laughs> he deadlifts both almost four hundred pounds, and he back squats almost three fifty. He does really well. And he's obviously a tank if he's doing all those things. If he's doing a linebacker and running back. <laughs>
Where did you get those believe in yourself necklaces? Um, so I bought, I actually did, had them designed and bought them. Did you hear what I did with that? No. So I didn't know about it until I read the book. Oh. Man, you're behind. <laughs> so I didn't know Josh was 6'3". <laughs> I remember when he was smaller than me. <laughs> what? Look down at him. We used to look up to you. Now you might be looking down at you. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, the bleed my... I can still outlift him, though, which is surprising. Yeah. <laughs> it won't be for long. <laughs> Give him a year. Give him a year. Uh, he's going to be joining the powerlifting club, so give him a year to see what happens. <laughs> I, the believe in yourself is a very big thing for a family. Um, so whenever you're playing sports or you're doing something and the kids like Madison plays soccer and she does dance and Josh well she used to do dance and Josh will play football there's always someone out there stronger and bigger than you no matter what or faster than you so whenever I see my kids um struggling I go like this to to them and what that means to them is oh, like, for the listener stuff. for the listeners uh Roger's uh sort of lightly lightly pounding on his chest with his fist. <laughs> right. It's, uh, it's, just, it's just below my neck, like my, um, my chin. And that's where the necklace line is. So what it is that it, it, it's a thing, believe in yourself, believe that you can conquer or beat that person or believe it that you can overcome whatever the issue you're in is. Uh-huh. So I got, so I got a jury design necklaces there's just some necklaces with charms and then the girls have round and the boys have a like a dog tag and it says believe in yourself and i got them all for christmas so the kids and myself wear this all the time except when they play sports where i touch on my chest is where the necklace line ends and that's where the charm is so when i do that they believe in themselves and they they say it in their heads and they actually do 10 times better at the thing they're doing Right. And I'm a strong believer that if you believe in yourself, you can overcome anything you need to overcome. So it doesn't matter the sports or, or that exam or that um, trying to learn how to build a car. If you believe you can do it, you can do it. And so I, that's our family model is believe in yourself. Because your daughter does compete at the highest levels as well, does she not? Like yeah, dance, soccer. I remember seeing that she won track even though she didn't win belong to the track team yeah she came in first place in track in, uh, in her school because she wanted to try it she wanted to she, try it and she won yeah and but. she she just goes and does what she needs to do to do it she never gives she, they don't doubt themselves and if they do doubt themselves they can touch their 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 neck where the charm is or they can remember what i say to them that's pretty cool Let's talk about a little bit about real estate. Because <laughs> your book, I'm at, the part yeah. that I'm at now is you're detailing uh, some of the lessons and a lot of your successes in, in real estate. Uh, yeah. now, because you're so experienced, and this is what I always tell people as well, is the more experience you have in real estate, the easier it is to spot opportunity. Um, yes. That's yeah. why I always encourage people to see as much property as possible. Uh, like including my team. Like when I became a realtor, it was actually a lot more bad. It was a lot easier because then you could see a lot of property. And we go through a lot of home inspections. So, you, you know, it's all relative. Yeah. We both invest in the same city. It's not we a do. new city. So we invest in older properties. So and that's the best in relation. That's the best we can do. You know, perfect world. Yes, I would love a brand new built, purpose-built duplex by a builder or a triplex or whatever. But that's not the hand, that's not the hand we're dealt with. We're not the hand right. we're dealt. But, so we're dealing typically with houses built in the 20s to 50s and 60s, 1950s, 1960s. Now you mentioned uh, you mentioned you were on a, you were on a tour, a property tour, and then you you saw a house with an attic that was unused that wasn't yep. being used. So yep. can you can you recount that story? Yeah. So when this um, wasn't one of my tours, was it? Oh. No. No, this is a, this is a, one of our friends, a mutual friends tours. He uh, he started a little real estate club, didn't last too long, and uh, he asked me to come out 
This, um, is, this is my competition then, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay, very good. <laughs> I, did, I don't, honest, listeners, I don't, I didn't know. I was like, damn it, was this one of my tours and no one saw this opportunity? Only Roger? <laughs> I expect better from my, my, from my team. But okay, go on. <laughs> the so competition, I understand. Go, yeah, you have to go on a tour and there's like only like five or six other people there. And, okay. and so I said, yeah, I'll go because I had nothing to do that day. So, and I wanted to see houses anyways. So I went through it tour and went to this this house on uh, Hamilton Mountain and it was just a bungalow with two bedrooms on the main floor um two bedrooms in the basement really ugly basement and that was it and they wanted um uh 375 for the place and it was on the market for like about uh three months so there's a lot of which is a really long there. time yeah which, yeah in our market that's that's like that's you know that's a very small percentage make it that long it is, and and I think because the fact that they want so much money at the time, um, and there was a lot of work that needed the base of that house. I, I saw this this old fashioned farm ladder that you pull from the ceiling yeah, yeah. down, and so I pulled the the ladder thing down, and the agent said, "We can't leave really you up there because you get hurt, then you're going to get in trouble." I was like, "Well, okay, I'm going up." So I went up. And, and there was actually two bedrooms up in the attic, um, but it wasn't really nice looking up in the attic. So it was actually a four bedroom house that didn't have a stairway up. It just had a ladder going up. Um, so I closed it and then um, I put an offer in. How much did that rental cost? Did you, did you have to put in new permanent stairs? Um, we put new permanent stairs. So we put new new stairs going up and down. We, we cut the uh, bathroom down. There's a large bathroom down boat a foot and a half to make the stairs wide enough the hallway. Right. And we took a little, little bit of about three feet away from the closet, from the master closet to make the stairs go up. And then we had um, stairs built and then they were past the inspection. Now, um, and then we finished the attic and it cost me about 25,000 to do the stairs, the attic and the main floor. And That's the basement is about 80,000. No. Oh, what did you do with the basement? And that, you made a legal suite? Yeah, legal suite, two bedroom permit. So, sorry, let's walk through the numbers again. What did you pay for it? What was it asking? And then what did you pay for it? 375. And then I, uh, I got it for 345. And then you spent 25K to do the attic and attic stairs? And, and the main floor to, to spruce it up, right? And then 80K for the basement? To make yep. it a legal suite? Yeah. And now what's it rent for? Um, upstairs is seventeen twenty-five. The garage is three hundred and the basement is fifteen fifty. All right, just bear with me. I'm one of those Asians that's not very good with mental math. <laughs> So hang on, you pay 345 plus 25 plus 80. So you're all in for about 450 versus you rent it for 1725. Why can't a garage get $300 a month? It's a huge garage. Two car? More? Three car garage. Three. Three. Three car. Wow. It was a brand new garage they built. Yeah, that's that works out to about nine point five percent annual rent income versus purchase price pro, purchase price plus improvements. That's a very good deal. What is the cash flow? Eleven hundred a month. Yeah, that's not bad. <laughs> impressive yeah. now in the book you also wrote about <laughs> in the book you also wrote about this abundance group so i happen to be part of it uh, yeah. and uh, i take these things for granted uh i should be more grateful for the the people that uh that happen to be in my world but what has this abundance group meant for you actually explain what the abundance group is and how you spelt it wrong <laughs> 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 so in the in the book it's called 
ambundance when it's behundundance because we're from Hamilton. Yeah. And they did spell it right one spot. Um, the editor, for some reason, might changed it, um, and then they didn't catch it until Irwin pointed out. Um, the the abundance group is a group of us guys that were, it's Irwin, Charles, and Andy, John, and Steve, and a few other guys. We are all real estate investors. We are all so let, um, just just for the listeners' benefit. So that's Steve Ford, uh, Charles Waugh, uh, James Mags. Uh, who am I missing? Andy Tran. John Romanis. Uh, John Romanis. So they've all been on this podcast, so everyone knows who they are, hopefully. <laughs> Sorry, continue. And yourself and myself. Myself and yourself. And continue. We, we, are all, we are all real estate investors and we are all self-made men, guys. And we, we encourage each other to succeed in life and we, we get together and not just talk about business but we actually do find events together we go to vegas we went to we did car thing we did some boating items we did for, we did it for dinner we went to our cottage we did a bunch of stuff together as a group to have fun um but also talk about real estate as well um and and investments like stocks and and um basically everything in life that comes to anything the abundance group is is I feel that I go, but I'm the, the, the guy in the low, the low part of totem pole because they're they all well, well educated and done really well in life. And I see myself as not there. The abundance group is, is something that I believe everybody should have. And it should be with a group of guys or a group of girls or whoever you want to be or mix, whatever. And it's a big group where you guys lift each other up and you guys help each other and you guys, um, or have the same interests and it's not negative it's always positive stuff and you have fun um, where my other friends that I grew up with um, they, they are the opposite of an abundance group they, we get together and all they talk about is stuff that their bosses are assholes or bosses do this their bosses does that and they don't understand that they don't need to work they need to build build freedom and abundance group shows gives us the freedom to do things and the abundance group is and it's just a bunch of we're a bunch of guys that have the same interests and we have fun together and we don't we don't worry about we're not supposed to worry about paying for things when we go because we, we're we're all we're all well off but i always worry because i'm always that's just me personality wise um and it's it's a, a really it's a really great group that I would never ever in my entire life known if I didn't get involved into real estate, and I would never have known these guys um, or their le- be at their level if I didn't get involved into real estate and and meet them through Irwin, and because those guys are just they're 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 way way above my pay grade, you think that way, but because the fact that I, I invested in and I done things right, I'm part of the group and it's very honored to be part of the group because they're like doctors and I'm like a, like a dead patient or something. It's just, it's just, it's just weird. And we're, I'm used to guys, my closest friends are always the opposite. They don't, they don't talk about the future. They don't talk about retirement. They just talk about, you know, they're, they're terrible uh, bosses and how they're struggling to pay their bills and, and how they wish to make more money, but they don't want to the initiative where the abundance group is, okay, well, we can do this and make money. No, it doesn't work. Okay, try something else. And they don't give up. They're just they're a bunch of guys that encourage each other and, and help each other. And if I recall any of them for any assistance, they would be there right away and vice versa, me um as well so that's the hub on this group to me now talking about now other crazy stuff we've done because the vegas trip was that was funny (laughs) (laughs) that was incredible actually and just just for the listeners benefit uh we tend to do we try to do things on the cheap (laughs) for example we uh when, when roger talked about driving cars 
uh, that we we bought a Groupon for that. Uh, when we drove when we drove the cars in Vegas, that was a Groupon as well. <laughs> 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 when we went to Vegas, that was a we flew the week right after New Year's Eve. So the plane, the plane was dead. <laughs> we got, I think it was three hundred dollars the return flight, <laughs> Canadian dollars <laughs> to return from from here to Vegas. So we do st- we do things on the uh, on the frugal, on the frugal. I like to say. Yeah, but we have we do things on a frugal because we we'd rather invest our money than versus be foolish with our money, right? So we would okay. rather do stuff like that. But it's well, still except for the club. I think the club costs more than our flight and hotel. <laughs> I think it costs more than a weekend. <laughs> but that was one night and that was fun. That was, you know, we, were, we lived the life of the rock star for that one night. Uh, so I want to talk about uh, not charity. Because we, uh, as you and I that first talked about forming the charity. Yeah. Why would you do that? Um, you, came to, you came to my house and talked about it and I, I was like all over it because the reason why I was all over it because I wanted to get back to the community and the people that we hit for charity was me. I was that person. Now, when I was growing up, there was nobody gave us turkey dinners. There was nobody that gave us the wish list, right? And and I know from from experience that those little things make a, could make a big difference in people's lives. And so that was, that's why I was all over it. And that's why I like the, the, uh, have the best brigade because we are helping people and we're just, even we, we, we give 30 families, for example, food or, or clothing and 29 of them were not appreciated, but their one person was, then it's worth it. Mm-hmm. It's worth everything we do because that one person says, Hey, I want to get back when I get older. And then they drop you know, a seed in their, in their head saying that they can do that. That's why, that's why I was like, oh, happy to do it and continue on doing it and want to continue doing it because the fact that I was there and I don't know how many people that you know that were there, um, but it's, it's not a life that anybody should be, be living. And if we can help, why not? What do your kids think about the charity? Um, they love it. They, they're, they want to do it every time it comes up. They, they have, they love giving back. They love helping. They love um, giving people an opportunity. They, they see the same way I do it. And my kids know that I came from um, how, how I was raised and how I was brought up, but they never experienced it. They don't know how it feels. They just know about it. And um, when my, when we did the first, Second one or first one, when my son saw a mom and we gave the food to that family, my son was like devastated that they were so happy they got food. And to that point, he, he's involved in all the charities we do no matter what. And I think because that reason as well, he also helps out other kids in schools and does things as well. And Madison, she's 1,000% involved in everything she can to help people because of the charity. Because she knows other people don't have the lifestyle that we have. Now let's go back to the book because I, I talked to you about this before we started recording because the book sounded like the PM business was the property management business. Uh, so for in case anyone's new to real estate, uh, many investors, you know, probably about 80% of our clients, they hire our property manager. So someone, they outsource the, the day-to-day activity of managing their property to someone. So, so you used to have a sizable property management business. So is this an easy business that anyone should just get into? Sounds very luxurious. Lots of money and uh, all you do is collect rent and sit on your butt. Um, If the property management business was, okay, the benefits of property management business is contacts for me. Um, I would not have known Matt Irwin or the Abundance Group or a bunch of investors that I still deal with today and and become my friends and family. The property management business is one of the hardest businesses that I believe anybody can do because you got to remember you're dealing with both sides. You're dealing with the owner of the property and you're dealing with a tenant and you cannot make everybody happy even though you try. If I started over again, I would not want to do a property management business. It's, it's, it's just a terrible business to be in 
but I got good benefits from it from the contacts and from the new friends and new family that I did develop because of it. Um, I was very happy to sell it um, because of the fact that it, it released so much stress. Like you're dealing with multiple different kinds of people. Um, even though you want to help them, they will still, you, you, you just can't. You just It's just incredible. It's a business that I would never want to do again. And I would, when I first started, I thought, well, it would be good to get to Madison and Joshua, you know? Like I started this business, created a big, huge business and give it to them. Hell no, I'd rather not. I'd rather go back and sell Stonecraft Dinner than do proper management business. Because I, I can I can be uh, empathetic because I you know I, I've I've heard you know I've been around for a while I've heard both sides, uh, you know I've gone through like five different property managers. Like my favorite property manager, her Google reviews is like under three, so out of five, it's under three. And this is the this is like the best property manager I know. Yeah, it's just yeah. a difficult business because when you have to evict someone for non-payment of rent or whatever else they did, they're not your friend. They do not like you. <laughs> nope. And they'll trash you and they'll, they'll create Facebook pages. They'll do anything they can to hurt you because you're just following the rules. They don't pay. It's your fault. They don't, they, they sell drugs and you catch them. It's your fault. They never mm-hmm. take blame themselves and they attack. Mm-hmm. And it's very stressful for a person to, to have that because they're just trying to live your life and you get this person consistently attacking you because you have them or you, you're going through how to be because you need to. It's, it's not a great business, but um, when you're when you're doing it, managing another person's properties, they're attacking you like that. You feel it hurts you. It does mentally it drains you. I don't know how how people still do prop management business, man. I do really don't. Do you remember the first time I talked to you about your pricing? Yeah. What did I say? You're too low. You need to charge more money. Why is that? Because of the, uh, the stress and the issues you go through. And I kept on saying, nope, no, I'm good. I'm okay making that much. And you get them saying, you charge too little. I'm like, no, no, it's good. Yeah, right. I should charge more. <laughs> so I say this out of love, right? How, and I don't mean to be arrogant in saying this, but Roger, all the advice I've ever given to you was from the heart. How often have I steered you wrong? <laughs> you you haven't. You haven't. But I, again, I, I'm one of those guys that need to learn from myself, my own experience, right? I need to build up my own, my own, my own knowledge um, and make mistakes and learn from them. And then, um, but I can always say that whenever something happens, I always find a good, good thing about it so Mm -hmm. if i got you know dragged to court i win but i learn Mm -hmm. and when i learn i can give the knowledge to other people Mm -hmm. and or use it for my own real estate portfolio so i'm still you're gonna still tell me to do something i'm gonna say no and then not do it and then i get screwed up but at least i'm gonna learn from it right because i told you to do stock hacking as well i know you have and i'm trying to do stock hacking And then just to uh, go back to the PM business, like to me, I can see the difficulty in running a business because you don't control the maintenance budget, right? Correct. You have to go build the owner for the maintenance or for repairs or for renovations. Like you don't set that number. You don't control it. The owner right. controls it. So when they don't offer it, when they don't give budget, how are you supposed to make the tenant happy? Like say a handrail falls off or snow removal needs to be done and the owner doesn't want to pay for it. Or say the air conditioner goes and the owner doesn't want to replace it with a new one. And you're, 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 you're the one that's in front of the tenant. Because yep. like in my model, the tenant, many, some of my tenants have no idea who I am. And that's, right. and that's usually the point of people hiring a property manager is you are the face for the rental business. So now you're on the brunt of that. <laughs> yep, and it happens a lot. And the, the thing is with my own properties, you're not pissing off tenants because of the AC breaks or hand rope breaks, you're, you're fixing it, right? Because the tenants know you. Mm-hmm. Where versus the, I, John Smith, for example, owns a property and he wants me not to fix something, the tenant mm-hmm. hates me. Mm-hmm. And I can't do anything. Um, there's 
plenty of times where I fixed things where the ten, the owners didn't pay. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's plenty of times where um, I fixed things I didn't charge owners because I just want to keep the tenant happy because it's a small little item. But right. um, you're doing, like I said, you're doing with two different people. And, and sometimes people get in the business for landlording, um, not realizing that there is other expenses you have to mm-hmm. deal with. And mm-hmm. it's long-term investment. It's not a short-term investment. Mm-hmm. And then something that I always implemented with, with in my business is I always, like I, I always told you if it costs less than $300 and it makes a tenant happy, just do it. Yep. Right. I chirped you sometimes like, Hey, you have uh, I forget. Oh, we have a mouse problem at this house. Can I send the exterminator? And I texted you back saying, is there any world, any, is there any scenario where I can say no to this? <laughs> no, just do it. <laughs> I know, but I, it's a habit of, don't know, ask me, just do it. <laughs> and you're right, but there is owners that said no. And that's the challenge. And then on the, on the flip side, you have, you have irrational tenants. Right. Right. Because you know the one I had who lived in a house by themselves for over two years. And then all of a sudden they had a cockroach infestation <laughs> <laughs> and that's my problem somehow, even though, <laughs> right. And of course there's going to be some landlords going to be pissed, but you know, you and I fought this guy together and, and the system was not in our favor. Nothing in the system worked in our favor, the city, the, the, the tribunal, nothing worked in our favor. Right. So, and then you again are the bearer of bad news. <laughs> And I have to come out of pocket for this. Not only have I to have to come out of the pocket, I have to, I have to speak to the Hamilton Health Department. Right? These are the joys of being a landlord. <laughs> it is. At the end of the day, if you can get through these little hip crops, it's, it's, it's worth it, right? Like, because right. look at us. Like, I, I barely work right now because of the fact that my real estate portfolio, mm-hmm. I was able to write, get a book written that I have a hard time spelling. <laughs> Which is incredible. So uh, you, as you mentioned the book, where can people get the book again? What's it and called? Where can they get it? It's called No Excuses um, by Roger Auger. Um, you can get it on Amazon. You can get it on uh, Kindle. You can get it at Chapters. Um, it's going to be in audio hopefully in a month or so. Um, or you can email me and I'll send you a copy as well. Um, at Roger. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's usually not a good idea to give email addresses. Do you have a website <laughs> people can can follow um, up? I've had complaints from like three years ago for people who give out their email addresses. That's why I cut you off. Oh, <laughs> is there yeah, a website I, or something? The that website. People... It's um uh selfassahamilton.ca. Um, That's the one you want to use for the book, okay? <laughs> the book. And they can contact us through there. Um, Sorry, what's the what's the website again? Selfass at hamilton.ca. Selfast at Hamilton. Dot, sorry, selfasthamilton.ca? Yes. Selfasthamilton.ca. Yeah. And, uh, so go to the website. I'm sure you can stick in your email address somewhere there. And then, of course. All right. Okay. But what, how, what if they're trying to sell their house? <laughs> well, then I'm not an agent, so we go back to you. <laughs> uh, do you, do you uh, wait? You have an Instagram. What's your Instagram? Uh, it's a uh, good question. I uh, I'll get we have some young you people on this show, so they, they like the Instagram. Also, to keep the uh, because the self ass Hamilton site is your is your wholesale uh, site, so yeah. maybe not the best place for people to interact interact with you. <laughs> you want to uh, keep those. You want to keep that that uh, group separate, right? People who just want talk to you actually about the book versus those who want to sell their house <laughs> fast <laughs> um the instagram is rocket roger properties um, on, the, on the ig yeah. rocket roger properties that's it instagram. all right roger i know you gotta go thanks so much for doing this we may have to do this again because we have some performance issues not your not your fault <laughs> Internet, internet right. performance issues. But Roger, thank you for doing this. Thank you for being so open. Thanks for writing the book. No problem. I'm hoping it, uh, it gets out there for someone that needs it. I really do because it's important. Amazing. Amazing. All right. Have a great day, Roger. Thanks again. Thanks. All right.